Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I think this is the 74th week, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so it's only going to be 15 days. <laughs> they said 74 weeks ago. Oh, my goodness. Well, hey, adapt and overcome. And hey, everybody is in for a real treat today. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, the latest and greatest, if you will. I don't know if it's the greatest, but it's uh, the infrastructure spend, spending bill, $1 trillion plus dollars. Um, and we have uh, live from Washington, D.C., our Washington Bureau Chief, Jack Santaniello. And uh, also live, wishing he was in uh, the Virgin Islands somewhere, but he's in an office in an undisclosed vote, uh, location near Lake Norman, I think, uh, Adam <laughs> Boatsman. And I'm just dreaming of clean juice today <laughs> in my office. So um, let's go ahead and go into some of this. You know, I've, <laughs> I don't know if this is true. And even if it is, I, I can't do anything about it. But supposedly, 23% uh, of the $1 trillion spending package actually deals with infrastructure. I don't know if that's true or not. I read it on the internet. Uh, so I, you've, been, you've been reading too far down the rabbit hole, Gary. That's all big. <laughs> Jack, you give us the budget breakdown. So I'm going to stall um, with some opening commentary so that he can chime in on the actual breakdown. But, you know, in terms of like literal, literal, literal definition of infrastructure, um, I don't know if 23% is the right number, but um, Part of that could be true. They also considered infrastructure broadband. Um, so that's another large component that's not in that 23%. Um, so it is a substantial portion of it to things that generally people agreed were um, was infrastructure spending. And you know, kudos to uh, Senator Byrne and Senator Tillis for voting yes to it um, in the sense that, um, hey, we're looking for compromise, which the definition of compromise is um, if both of us are upset and pissed off, it probably means we compromise, right, Jack? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So if we're both angry, then it's a good deal. That's how <laughs> anyway. mediations work, too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, a couple things for this week. Um, obviously, this infrastructure bill passed. Um, and then at the same time, the IRS dropped a nugget <laughs> on the employer retention tax credit. Um and both were related. So with the employer retention tax credit, part of the, there weren't really that many tax provisions in the infrastructure bill that passed the Senate uh, that is now going to the House, other than, hey, we want to ramp up enforcing and collect, ta collect taxes that we don't, we're not currently getting paid. So basically that beef up the IRS to go after people who are underreporting. Um, that said, you know, part of the part of the package was to stop the employer retention tax credit, except for for certain recovery startup businesses, which is basically new companies um, that started in the middle of pandemic. As of the third quarter, all that really means, you know, we've had a lot of questions around, oh, my God, does that mean that I'm not going to qualify after the third quarter? No, what that means is the credit will not be available for wages in the fourth quarter of the um, 2021, but for, you know, the alternative method of calculating the credit, which means that if you had the restoration in 20 quarter, in other words, if your quarter, typically what would happen is that if you were down 80, you know, 20% or greater in a quarter, then the next quarter automatically qualifies. In this particular case, that still is potentially true it's just that the fourth quarter of 2021 doesn't qualify on its own um, going forward so that was one big thing the other big i know it's kind of confusing but basically don't plan on quarter four 2021 wages <laughs> um assuming that all of this survives the but in the um in the irs drop there wasn't anything huge in the IRS drop other than the treatment of owners of S corporations 
and um, C corporations that are greater than 50% owners. Basically, they said that, you know, the only way those wages are going to qualify is if I'm married and we have no living dependents, which means children, spouses, relatives, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, you know, blah, blah. So basically, if I'm an orphan and I'm married, I can likely deduct my wages if my wife also is an orphan. Wow. If that is not the case, I probably cannot deduct wages in its current format as written. Hopefully this doesn't last because it's about the most ridiculous thing ever written. I think we, we were probably accepting in the fact that um, owners of greater than 50% wages probably weren't gonna qualify as would other people working in the business. Like that, that wouldn't have been too surprising to me, but to say, look, even if they're not working in the business, um, they don't qualify, you don't qualify because you have relatives that are living, that's asinine, <laughs> um, but that's what they wrote. So not much that we can do about it. So those, those are the two big um, things that came out would be, yeah, no, I, I was actually trying to see if you would adopt me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to make it worse for you, not the other way around. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think the quarter four thing will probably live um, the way that it stands because I think that you know there's this general feeling that hey, things are uh, rebounding enough, um, and people need to get back to work and all that other uh, stuff. But in terms of the family attribution rules. I really hope that, you know, so the, what would end up happening with the family attribution rules is that either something would happen within Congress, a further pronouncement comes out that contradict says, hey, by the way, we got it wrong, or it gets challenged in court is, is the path is the path forward for this family attribution ruling uh, that they made. So um, who knows where to last. In terms of the, the Bernie Sanders $3.5 trillion um, Senate, bill that passed which i'm amazed gary you didn't bring that one up i would have brought that one up <laughs> yeah. I, I, i'm trying to bite bite my tongue <laughs> yeah so there, there were two there were there were two tax proposals you know they, so what happens is they bring up a bill and then they call it the voterama but it's basically people that attach amendments to the bill just so they can get on record so there were two there were two tax things one favorable but actually both were favorable um, that came up as amendments to the bill. So in the, in the bill itself, it does, it's actually silent on how we would pay for any of this. So the operating presumption is probably not going to be through borrowing a bunch of money. It's going to be through the, you know, shenanigans of the, the economy is going to grow plus a tax rate increase. So there were not any proposals for tax rate increases specifically. However, there were two amendments. One passed, one failed. The amendment that passed is, you know, we just had last week's webinar on the 1031 exchange. So what, what passed was an amendment that said, we will make permanent the 1031 exchange effectively. Like you can't make any changes to that as part of this process. So that was generally good. Um, also good was an amendment that was offered up to make heirs, H-E-I-R-S, not hairs, heirs. Um, so basically, if you inherit something, for you to have to pay capital gains tax on the inherent gain in that. So basically, it would eliminate the step, it would eliminate the step up in basis and say you got to pay gain on that. That failed. So um, those are kind of the two big tax things that happened that kind of, if anything's going to happen through this whole process of reconciliation and stuff like that. Those are just two. If you're reading the tea leaves, you know, 1031 survives to fight another day. And the inherent gain, um, taking taking that the the get the step up in basis on the gain, that did not pass. Uh, Kristen Simon across party lines uh, to shoot that down. You know, related note, you know. Senator Manchin from West Virginia, you know, his commentary was, wow, I, I voted for it, but this is a lot of money. I have no idea how we're going to pay for it. So <laughs> and he's, he's generally been um, 
anti massive um, tax law changes. So, you know, assuming they got to get this vote somehow, uh, we'll see. So, anyway, that's what I got, Jack. Hey, before um, our Washington, D.C. bureau chief uh, takes the mic, um, I want to address this question because I think you addressed it pretty well, but I want to read it for everybody else. Mike, thanks for getting this in. He says, very interesting topic. Looking forward to it. Here's my question. My understanding that is that right now, Nancy Pelosi is saying she won't bring the infrastructure bill to a vote in the House until the Senate passes reconciliation bill. Seems like it could take several months to get both bills through chambers. If that's the case and drags on into November or October, isn't there a point where it becomes too late to retroactively change the ERTC credit rules? Yeah, so remember that the credit rules as they survive now um, offer up an extension and this basically just eliminated part of the extension. So my assumption would be if this stretched out too long, then what would end up happening is you just would effectively have the, have the employer retention tax credit through the end of the year instead of cut off on September 30th. If I, if I was just speculating, I don't see a scenario where they would say retroactively we're cutting it off as part of a reconciliation process. They might, but I just, I don't see that happening. So Jack, our Washington DC bureau chief is, uh, high atop a cherry picker someplace out there on the mall. Uh, Jack, the mic is yours. Thank you. It's the view from the back of our office at, at our, uh, in Washington. In the middle, if you know where this is from, it's uh, in the middle of a lawn, actually. So it's an impossibility. So anyway, all right, you ready? <laughs> live oh, from Washington. <laughs> all right, live from Washington. This is SLK News. The Senate voted today, or voted yesterday, 69 to 30, to approve a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. There were 19 Republicans who voted for the bill, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. There are a number of progressive Democrats that are frustrated with this bill because they see it as being a limited scope of the overall proposed bill. As mentioned previously, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she will not take up the bipartisan measure until the broader budget bill has also passed the Senate. Mr. Schumer expects that the committees will finish their work on the bipartisan bill by September 15th, just weeks before the deadline to increase the federal borrowing limit and approve federal spending for the next fiscal year. Here are some of the details of the, 100 and of, of the, multi, of the trillion dollar bill. 110 billion for roads and bridges. 73 billion for electrical grid and power infrastructure, 66 billion for passenger and freight rail, 65 billion for broadband investments, 55 billion for water systems and infrastructure, 50 billion for Western water storage, Western with a capital W, don't know what that means, okay. 39 billion for public transit, 25 billion for airports, 21 billion for environmental remediation projects, 17 billion for ports and waterways, 15 billion for electrical vehicles, and 11 billion for road safety. So let's talk about some other details of the package. Some say that it will, it is being paid for it by itself. However, according to the Congressional Budget Office in a report last week, the package would add $256 billion to the deficit over the next 10 years. Also of note, this package is far short of the $2.25 trillion proposal that President Biden unveiled in March. It's all otherwise known as the American Jobs Plan. Republicans were critical of the plan because it makes investments in areas that are not traditionally considered infrastructure. So let's talk about how Congress is proposing to pay for it. As I said a moment ago, there is an estimated $350 billion that would be added to the deficit. The CBO brushed aside several major provisions that lawmakers, when they were saying this is a zero-sum game, said uh, that repurposing certain unused COVID relief funds and using the savings generally 
uh, generated by states terminating pandemic unemployment provisions early was not sufficient to fund it. Agency, the agency found these measures would provide roughly 22 billion in savings rather than the 263 billion claimed by lawmakers. There are other provisions in here where they are gonna uh, charge for auctions related to FCC stuff. So basically airwaves, uh, 50 billion via super fund feeds, et cetera, on cryptocurrencies and other stuff. So I know you're asking yourself, so what is missing? I will tell you. What is missing <laughs> is 400 billion to bolster caregiving for aging and disabled veterans. What is missing is expanded access to long-term care services under, med under Medicaid. Also missing is improved wages for home health workers, 100 billion for workforce development, 18 billion to modernize the veteran, the VA hospitals. But on the other side of it, there's a slew of corporate tax hikes that were opposed by Republicans that were part of the American Jobs Plan, uh, in particular, raising the corporate income tax rate to 28% from 21% as well as increasing the minimum tax on US corporations to 21%. There was also a potential levy of a 15% minimum tax on income on the largest corporations that report to investors. And we, I think we talked about this previously, book, book, book income versus um, other income. So uh, that is kind of the short and skinny of it. And so my last comment is to all of you to stay classy. Oh, hey, um, so what's interesting is Joe Farrell found the chat button. So for anybody else uh, and you don't know where the chat button is, ask Joe. He knows where it's at. <laughs> and he says that that Jack as a newsman needs a teleprompter. Well, here's the deal. All the teleprompters have been uh, in short supply. They're stuck in ports or they're in the White House. So sorry. Uh, but you did a great job without the teleprompter, Jack. So thank you very much for that. Any clue? I know you were reading. I didn't know if you could do math at the same time. But uh, was infrastructure, in fact, only 23% or approximately? While, uh, while you do some Rain Man math, um, Adam, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> Um, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the, I forgot to hit on it on the other tax provisions. So, so Jack, so Jack mentioned it while he was scrolling through <laughs> just like it's probably four or five years ago, um, maybe longer, uh, broke invest Brokerage houses like Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, and other people like that were required to report your cost basis on the 1099Bs that you receive from them if, if they know it. If they didn't know it, they were supposed to say, we don't know it. Um, that same thing now applies to cryptocurrency. Um, so you're supposed to report. So, so if it's available and you're trading through a platform cryptocurrency, they're supposed to, you're supposed to report your cost basis. So that, that was another... That was another piece of the, uh, the how we're going to pay for it. The jacket on. Back down on crypto. <laughs> no, no more free rides on crypto. Just kind of like remember, at one point we didn't pay sales tax on uh, internet transactions back twenty years ago. Right. Oh, uh, Jack, you're on mute, buddy. Sorry, I did not find the answer. Um, and what I don't know is, I, I think that what was passed and all the things that I, I said um, are infrastructure related, and it's the other stuff that I said was excluded that is not infrastructure related. So I don't know if that percentage relates to the whole, the entire, the big plan that this is part of. Um, and that goes back to the comment of Nancy Pelosi saying, hey, look, until it all gets through, I'm not going to, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to bring people back from recess. I'm not going to do all these things. I think that there's going to be a lot of political pressure. You know, they've, they've been pointing, Democrats have been pointing at Republicans and saying, you guys are the obstructionists. And now for her to, there's just a lot of good that's in this. 
as far as, again, there are people who have their opinions as to, well, wait a minute, who's paying for all this? And now are we getting into, you know, all kinds of socialism and everything else? I'm not, I'm not promoting or saying anything about that. I'm just saying that, that obviously people on both sides of this, there's actually more than two sides of it. There are people on all sides of this. And so um, I, I just think that I don't think Ms. Pelosi can hold out like she says she intends to do for a long period of time before people are saying, okay, uh, you, you finally got the Republicans to move in your direction. Isn't a piece better than the in entirety, especially since we were focusing on infrastructure and yes, the VA is important and are all these other things, but we can't do it all at one time. So let's not block a good portion of it and, and stuff that everyone has agreed to most everyone, at least enough people have agreed to it on the Republican side of things to get through this, at least in the Senate. There's going to be a lot of work that has to be done in the House, but, um, you know, it, and even even on the Democratic side of the House that are having issues with certain things. So it's not a sure thing. And that's why, you know, okay, we've, we got it through the, you got through the Senate. It's like, okay, sure thing. It's going to be, no, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, even on the Senate side of things with the details before and, and then as it moves over to the other chamber in the House of Congress. Joe, we agree. And my son, who is with uh, the, the state of Kentucky, uh, focused on water and clean water, he would agree. He's all in on U.S. water infrastructure plan. I don't know anybody. <laughs> I don't know anybody. Uh, the greediest capitalist in, in, on the planet, I think, would still be for clean water, clean air, <laughs> so and, and roads that don't eat your car. Uh, there are some of those up in Cleveland, Ohio, that I have been. And you know, if you're in a small car, you're going to lose it <laughs> into the into those big old potholes. So, anyway, any questions out there from the gallery? Yeah, I think pretty good crew. Yeah, it's a good crew as we wait to see, you know, any any questions rolling in. I think, you know, all the all the same tax stuff that was on the table is still on the table in the sense that, you know, rolling back the estate tax limitation, raising corporate income taxes from 21% up to 25, 20, 25%, um, rolling back the qualified business income deduction. Um, which, and then raising, you know, raising your effective, your, your marginal rates, like meaning each one of the tax brackets up a couple percentage points. I mean, that, that's really still all on the table. So what it basically boils down to is, you know, Hey, we're going to basically eliminate everything that happened in the tax cuts and jobs act, which Trump passed. But for we're not going to make the C corporation income tax rate as bad as it used to be. I mean, if, if I was to sum this whole thing up in a nutshell, that's what it sums up in a nutshell. It's going back to the same rates we had under Obama, but the C corporation tax rate won't be 35%, it'll be 25%. That, that's really it. And, and then we're going to monkey with the um, estate tax to take away the step up in basis, which is basically. Again, I die, um, leave my highly appreciated Apple stock to Gary. Um, Gary sells it the day Thank after you. I die. Gary owns, owes no capital gains tax, um, other than the appreciation that happened in the day that Gary inherited to the day that he sold it. So assuming that there was no market value change, he's got no uh, tax due on that. So that's one piece. And then rolling back the estate tax limitation, which is going to happen anyway. Naturally, if Congress doesn't do anything, because part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was the estate tax raised to where it's at now wasn't permanent. It was set to expire in 2026. So I think the same guidance that we've had for clients all along uh, still holds, which is, you know, one, if you haven't done anything about estate and succession planning, you really ought to because you're leaving you're you're likely leaving exemption dollars on the table. And then two, um, if you're looking to sell your company, you know, 
you, there's probably not a need to rush out and fire sale it because you're worried about capital gains rates. Instead, I would be focused on, um, can I can I do part of it through an installment sale to control the amount of gain that I'm recognizing in any given year, or I'll or do some other planning around it to reach the exemption level of a million bucks that they've been they've been talking about. And and guys, I don't know if this this may be a spoiler, so you can stop me. But um, we the, between the three of us, so the people that are on the call now, we've been talking about you know the what we might talk about in future Thursdays at eleven o'clock, and one of those is estate planning, succession planning in relation to what's going on. Um, I, I will tell you that um, from my estate planning partners that there is a little bit of paralysis in a sense that, okay, we can do certain things, but you know, the clients have to are made aware that we may have to redo certain things depending on how things turn out because we're making certain assumptions that we're not necessarily sure what's going to happen with, with some of this stuff. So, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things, stay tuned, but yet, you know, you, you still need to, you need to do the best that you can with the current circumstances, with the current regulations and things like that for estate planning and for succession exit planning purposes. But um, at some point, we, we may go through kind of a, a walkthrough of what those things look like. But again, it's just speculation. It's like, okay, this is what it might mean on, you know, under, under pathway A, and then this is what it might mean under pathway B. So something to stay tuned for down the road um, at the appropriate time for one of these sessions. Well, if you think about it, 74 weeks ago, everything that we were doing was somewhat speculation given the thimble full of information that was dripping and drabbing you know, out. And um, this last week, I had a conversation with somebody that said, you know, you guys have been consistent and, and you know, why do you guys keep doing that? And I said, because we were frustrated with the same sanitized talking points that meant nothing that everybody else was spewing at the same time hey you know we're in the, th the the fight with everybody else we're just trying to make the best out of it sometimes we get it right sometimes we get it wrong i'd say from a batting percent uh, percentage we've done pretty well um you know adam jack um and so you know the one thing that i do know is when I've run companies and I felt really alone and I didn't have a sounding board to get the noise out of my head, that was, those were the lowest times. Those were the toughest times. And these have been hard times, you know, let's just face it. Um, yeah, we got people that are tonning it and we got others that, you know, were holding on for dear life, wondering if they were going to make it to the next day. So, um, you know, bottom line is, is we're just trying to be here for you. And we want this to be time that's valuable for you so if you have thoughts and you have things that you want us to cover let us know um oh thanks man uh rich these have been uh great value add for two weeks you've attended you've you're gonna have to go back and spend a lot of time <laughs> going through the archives all the youtube channel the BGW CPA YouTube channel, because they're all there. <laughs> hey, and speaking of that, oh, we do have a question here. Um, oh, thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, go back. If you missed last week's 1031 exchange, if you have questions and you wonder about 1031 exchange, you know a little bit to be dangerous, not enough to be proficient. Matt Linville is really good. Um, and uh, that is worth spending an hour recapping. If you ever need a connection to him, there's nothing in it back for us. We're not monetizing that relationship or anything. We, we don't do that typically. So, um, but anyway, he also sent us last night, you know, that the, the Senate had adopted John Kennedy, the Senator from Louisiana, his amendment to preserve these 1031 like kind exchanges. Um, and even if you don't agree with uh, John Kennedy, he's got to be one of the funniest guys I've heard. He is pretty funny. Um, okay, let's see what else on chat. Oh, yeah. Douglas, awesome. Thanks, man. It's good to see you here. Uh, hey, let's see. Hey, Gary, if it's okay if I hop in as well. Please do. Uh, the, 
kind of last note on the employer retention tax credit, you know, it we we we've said it a few times during the webinar. You know, on the gross receipts, employer retention tax credit has effectively two tests. One test is just a straight up gross receipts test. You know, quarter quarter in 2020 down greater than 50% than same quarter in 2019. Woo, you qualify. Uh, quarter in 2021 down greater than the same, down greater than 20% in the same quarter in 2019. Woo, you qualify. Well, that's path A. Path B is um, the government did it to me. <laughs> so in path B with the government did it to me, which is effectively the exception clause, even if you didn't meet the revenue reduction tests, but the government, you know, literally, and by government, that's federal, state, and local government, issued an order that impacted your business um, by greater than 10%, then you also qualify. So where, you know, so for example, and it, it, again, this isn't, so we've got a lot of clients out there that we, we think fit in this bucket. So BGW, we're in process of, you know, sending out, you know, kind of opt-in messages to say, hey, let's do some analysis to see if you qualify or not. But, you know, to give you a couple examples of where it's, you know, gray, <laughs> Uh, in terms of, hey, do I qualify or, or not qualify? The, these are literally specific examples that are in the IRS publications that have come out. So, you know, I have a medical clinic that has a small component associated with emergency procedures and a large component associated with um, electric procedures. Government order said, hey, all that stuff shut down except for emergency procedures. You know, even if I didn't have a revenue reduction because that, that order didn't last for that long of a time in the state of North Carolina, even if I didn't have a revenue reduction on balance, you know, I still am going to qualify because I had a drop in the non-electric procedure side. Restaurants, it's pretty easy because their capacity was restricted by government order. But in the case of like a grocery store, you know, if you operate at a grocery store, uh, then, you know, on the one hand, you can say, well, it was retail, there was social distancing um, encouragement that was said, but there wasn't really a rule around that. Well, with the grocery store, your hours were restricted. <laughs> um, like, so if you were a 24 hour grocery store and then your hours were restricted, well, now you qualify. So it's not quite as easy as just, well, the government order didn't specifically call me out. It's really, you know, kind of any impact that you had that was directly related to a government order and you couldn't pivot in telework. Um, there's a chance that you qualify. The other scenario that you may qualify is if you had a supply chain shutdown. So the government shut down your supplier, you know, specifically or curtailed your supplier's hours. So let's assume that your supplier you know, ran 24 hour shifts, but now they can only run from eight to eight and you can't get product. Okay, that, that means that there's a good chance that you qualify. So just, you know, don't close the door on, hey, I'm probably not gonna qualify because I didn't meet the gross receipts test. You know, if you feel like you had a disruption due to government order in your supply chain or your hours of operation or capacity, there's a, there's a good chance that you might qualify under the exception uh, rules. All right, so I'm going to throw out two things. One is if anyone in can tell us what, where I got the quote from when I closed my little fake newscaster. It wasn't fake news, fake new newscaster. Then you get a Starbucks gift certificate. Um, secondly, unrelatedly, but important is something, you know, every once in a while, if you join us, you get free nuggets of free information and Mark, Mark, you're the winner. Okay. So, um, and Mark says, so send to Gary, your information, if he doesn't already have it, and I'll get that out to you. It's an like, it'd come an email with a link with a password, and then you can add it to your, uh, start your current Starbucks, uh, card, and then you can go use it, uh, at Starbucks. So. Um, unrelatedly, and this is, is, is very important, 
um, and it's a drafting, a contract drafting provision um, uh, related to the corporate world, but also to you personally when you're signing contracts, for example, the purchase of a house. Um, I think there is a presumption that if a deadline, for example, a due diligence deadline and a security deposit going hard, essentially being uh, unretrievable by the seller falls on a Saturday, Sunday or holiday, then surely that means the next business day. Um, I will tell you surely not. And this, this has come up recently, actually more than once. And you know, fortunately, the, we weren't any incidents in relation, and everything worked out in those, those particular matters. But um, what happened was is that there was it was a date certain that said the due diligence period ends on this date, and it was a weekday, and it wasn't a holiday. It was so somebody checked, but then as the deal moved through, that was changed to 60 days after the effective date of this agreement. Well, as you might expect, that then creates a very variable date in the document. It happened to be that that date now, 60 days plus, fell on a weekend. And so um, you know, it came down kind of to the wire as to um, uh, the Friday before. And it was uh, an uncomfortable situation for the other side to be in. And um, you know, there was a, a little bit of grace and understanding with respect and the deal went through, but you know, it could have um, the particular party who had leverage could have been very adamant about the fact that it that's when it, when the deadline was. And so you need to be careful in drafting and, and this, there are those provisions in a residential real estate contract. And in fact, the form for the, that the realtor, the North Carolina realtors form is very specific in the opposite direction, which is that uh, well, th this one particular form is that uh, days means calendar days and includes Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. From, from a commercial business context, you, you might imagine the impossibility under certain circumstances, which is banks are closed on those days. So, you know, the movement of money is kind of an impossibility. Um, but also, you know, people are not necessarily monitoring emails and stuff like that. Um, relatedly to that is that words mean what they mean in documents unless there's ambiguity. So in a commercial real estate form, it uses the word, um, well, what was it? It wasn't when the notice is sent. It wasn't when the notice was received. The word was provides. If the, if, if the buyer provides notice, um, maybe we could have set it up for a poll, but what exactly does provides mean? Now, um, uh, fortunately, no one had to get a, a summer associate or young associate to do some research and what, to what that means. So again, and this is obviously your attorney's job to do, but you know, just be mindful of that, that, that uh, the timing issues and don't make assumptions that um, you know, deadlines that fall on uh, um, a certain day mean in the weekend fall into the next business day. They do in certain circumstances, like for example, loans and, and loan agreements and things like that because they're bank generated. So um, anyway, I just thought I would share that little nugget of information, which is usually again, not your responsibility. It's your counsel's responsibility or, whoever, or your broker's responsibility to make you aware of that. But it just seemed to come up uh, at least twice in the past two weeks. Fortunately, we were on the right side of things, uh, and fortunately that it all worked out. So anyway, um, there is your free legal advice for the week. So, so Jack, um, while you're on a roll, this is another Jack theory coming up. Oh boy. Joe's on a roll. Um, so here's a question that came from Joe. Jack, as COVID morphs for the fourth or fifth time, do you see mandatory vaccin vaccination coming into play more in the future, future diseases? That, it's an interesting question because it, it does, you know, we've talked about this, I think like two weeks ago about vaccinations and masks. And I, I think that, and, and we also talked about exceptions to the forced vaccination or mask wearing or things like that. And, and so far it's been really kind of two categories. One is medically related 
uh, and the other is um, religion and you know a, a good faith religious belief proven belief and as i said before you can't go from being a heathen one day and then all of a sudden catch faith that uh, allows you to not wear a mask that you can't do things like that but subject to that i, I think that but, but on the other side too is is you know some people's view of this is it's like the flu there's a, these variants i mean the flu every year is a variant of the prior year's flu or um you know, a, a more metamorphosis or um, variant or um, uh, what was the word that was used this morning? But it's it's a, a different version of it. Uh, I, I know what it was. It was actually Dr. Fauci saying that if it, the only way that it mutates is mutation, the only way it mutates is if it spreads because you have to have spread in order for it to mutate. And if you don't have spread, then it, the mutations are, are lesser. I'm not a scientist or a pathologist or anything else, but, um, you know, and, and I know some people disagree with Dr. Fauci. And so anyway, again, not political, not medical. I'm just saying it, to answer your question is that I think that it's, it's, it's going to remain difficult, challenging to implement those kind of things. I've uh, had um, clients with employees that have left employment or threatened to leave employment if certain mandates were put in place. I've had um, clients who've come to me and said, hey, this is an employee of a competitor with a non-compete, can we hire them? And the reason why they're leaving is because there was a mandate put into place. That's a whole different legal issue uh, with respect to violations and, and contributions to violating a non-compete covenant. But the, the same principle remains, which is um, at, at least for us, we're taking a softer approach as to uh, making it a personal preference, but there are consequences associated with that, which is reporting requirements, uh, testing requirements potentially. We recently had someone whose uh, child, uh, college age child was exposed, they tested positive, and we're like, you know, you get to stay home. And um, so someone brought her laptop and a few files down to, uh, down to the parking garage and handed it off to her. So, um, you know, but that, again, is that a required accommodation under those circumstances? That's just, uh, you know, us being, okay, we need this person to be working rather at home or here. Some people don't have the ability to do that. So again, long-winded way of saying that um, time will tell, but right now you, um, you are permitted to, so long as it's not illegal or discriminatory, uh, allowed to uh, have mandates for immunization and mask wearing, again, subject to exceptions. So, um, you know, to, to your point earlier, is that uh, when, when we're talking about doing these things, this being the 70th week, is that when we say things, it's, it's not advice, it's guidance and, and our opinions and not necessarily the opinions of our respective organizations. So in, in, in this case, it really just depends. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, it, it, uh, the, the details matter. Things like the width of the corridors that you have people going down. Do you have them you know, sufficiently apart from each other? Have you, do you have certain processes in place? For example, we have in our reception area, um, one of those plexiglass shields to protect our uh, receptionists. Uh, we've removed chairs in our conference rooms, so there is more spacing in between people. And anytime I go into a meeting now, I always have a mask with me in case that person wants me to wear a mask. And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that, uh, to be accommodative to that, because I don't know what's going on in their lives. They may not be vaccinated. They may be concerned about uh, having someone in their household who is not vaccinated or maybe not even eligible for vaccination. And I really don't wanna ask those questions. It's none of my business. So I'm just gonna, the, the common denominator is if someone wants me to wear it, and most actually have declined. They're like, okay, I'm, you know, I was only wearing a mask because I thought you wanted me to. And I'm like, I'm fine with that. Um, and I'm thinking in my head, you just don't cough on me kind of thing. So, and it <laughs> is funny now, like in meetings when people, when people cough, you know, it's like, okay, uh, COVID, COVID. Yeah. And, and people actually feel I feel like they have to get defensive and say, oh, I don't have COVID. I'm, I've been immunized. Like that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth after they sneeze or cough these days. So it's just, it's just funny to see. Yeah. My, my own 
my own speculation, and I have not looked up to see what's past president, past precedent with like polio and mumps and stuff like that is that, you know, the, the moot point is that every school is going to require it. That's going to pass a legal challenge. And then adults, they'll just leave it to a business to decide. And whatever the business decides, we'll, we'll pass that challenge. <laughs> and that that's, you know, that's the end of it versus like mandatory anything. Um, so that, that's just my own, that's my own, that's my own speculation at this point is that there probably will not be any sort of government mandate that all um, able-bodied people have to get vaccinated, period. It'll be, you know, the kids, if they want to go to school and participate, you're going to have to do it. Uh, if you're going to work for these certain employers, you're going to have to do it. And if you want to do these things, you're going to have to do it. Otherwise, knock yourself out. This is my own, my own speculation at this point. And I think, as you've seen, I think it was recently, the most recent one, I think maybe was Wells Fargo, but um, maybe B of A has followed suit that they are extending. You know, Labor Day was kind of like the benchmark to, okay, let's get everybody done with their vacations or now not vacations, depending on whether you feel comfortable going out and about. But Labor Day was kind of like the, the point of, all right, let's try to get back to some normalcy, get people back in their physical offices. And that's been pushed out. Uh, there are more and more. I mean, I, I wish I had stock and kind of a computer remote. I mean, the whole technology business, because I just, you know, the inventory of that kind of stuff is just going crazy. In addition to having shortages of the microchips that go inside of those machines. So, you know, all of these things are, are building up towards the businesses to the extent they are able to allow people to work remotely rather than having to deal with this dissension that you have to come into the office, you have to get a shot, you have to wear a mask. And so, um, and then there's the kind of the middle ground, which is some employers, some of our clients are saying, okay, you can come back into the office or you can work from home. But if you come into the office, this is what you have to do. You have to be immunized. You have to wear a mask, even if you're immunized. You, um, you know, don't, you don't put 12 people in a, in a conference room. I mean, things like that. Um, we have been uh, somewhat reluctant in, you know, everybody look forward to Thursday mornings because we had, depending on the day, whether it was healthy day or if it was junk food day, meaning donuts and, and then on the other side, like granola and yogurt and uh, fruit, um, which was a funny aside that people got a little bit upset when we added the fruit option into the, the mix of things. So like, no, <laughs> we can eat healthy on our own. We want you to feed us junk food is kind of the message. So, um, but so we have, we have a healthy rotation, healthy week in the rotation of stuff. So um, but again, it's, I, I think that their business owners are trying to be as accommodative, but there are some businesses where you just have to be in person in order to be efficient for certain things that you just can't work remotely. Um, and then in, in some businesses, it's just better to work in person. So that, that's why I think that you're not gonna, one of the reasons why you're not gonna see a mandate for private businesses across the board. I think that, um, you know, you see the government putting in mandates, but that's, their, that's their employer I mean, that is their yeah so they have a job they're employed by the federal government and they have to follow federal government rules again within the constraints of not being discriminatory so someone had asked me well, why why can the government get away with it well i mean in some sense they are an employer and they have employees and they set up rules just like any other private employer does but there's a lot more rules that they have to follow with respect to when they implement across the board programs like in the military, like the, the Department of Defense is, is attempting to do. I don't know if that actually passed or not, but that was a big topic this week is that um, Secretary, of, Secretary of DOD wanted, was pushing for the mandate that I think masks, but also potentially vaccinations uh, for all um, active personnel, both military and civilian which also goes into, okay, what about the independent contractors that are contractors to the government? You know, how far does this go into? So 
Again, another can of worms, maybe for another day. Very interesting discussion. It's good stuff. Um, and by the way, Jack, I would rather have you doing real news than with without a teleprompter than teleprompters doing fake news. So thank you for keeping it real, man. <laughs> yeah, of course. And actually, the reality is I could have done teleprompter-ish, like had these, but I was pulling from three different articles. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> switching screens, then I'll mess it up. And then, you know, what would happen is I'd hit the X button for the Zoom, and then I'd be like, okay, uh, <laughs> blackout in Washington. And then that would start a panic. So, okay. Yeah, then it could start a whole panic across the nation. Uh-oh, what just hit us? That's right. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it's for the greater any, other, any questions out there? And no, Joe, Joe thanks for keeping it uh, alive. That's good. If there's nothing, we aren't going to just keep belaboring it. Um, so while we wait, any last thoughts from you, Jack or Adam? Uh, I'd go with that, Jack. Just keep it classy. San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Charlotte, but I know there's people that are not, that are on here, not from Charlotte. So yeah. I think I said my friends, I meant to say, if I didn't say, I was like, stay classy, my friends. <laughs> I can't do the burgundy thing. Ron Burgundy. Oh man, that, that, that was a funny movie. All right. Well, anybody that came on here late, we will put this thing up on the BGWCPA YouTube channel and uh, we'll get that up later on today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jack, for um, getting high atop that cherry picker on the mall so that you could do this live. Appreciate it. It's really good that the wind was light today. It didn't blow off your all your 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 readings. So, um, Adam, good to have you back. I know you took a kid to college yesterday, and that's always a man. That's I, it. Still kind of chokes me up thinking about it. And the last time I did it was. 2008 <laughs> so yeah, i think i think jack you went to carolina right oh yeah yeah i so found a way to stay for seven for an extra three years in graduate yeah, school so, not undergrad but yes yeah, so, so yeah. we we did we did seven flights of stairs to granville hall over and over and over and over and over did i say over and over again yeah Somebody and it wasn't it. hot yesterday was it oh no, it was not hot at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah your legs yeah. your legs will feel it tomorrow if not today but yes um yeah i we're, we're i got one more year before i have to do that with my elder elder child so um but yes there were a lot of tears shed from people around me that had to go through that experience in the past two weeks so yeah it's a rite of passage and it's interesting one thing that's the weirdest thing, and I'll just leave it with this, is when we came back from our last kid going to college for the first time, came back to a clean room that hadn't been clean since the kid was born. <laughs> and so it's like, ah, uh, you know, I was, I was happy about the clean, but man, I missed him. <laughs> so anyway, you all have a great week. Uh, what's left of it. Stay safe out there. Thanks for being part of this. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks.